Hi, welcome back. For the last 26 years, I've spent the first week of every year doing something that most of you will probably think is extraordinarily boring. I collect data, raw data, on publicly traded companies, and then I summarize the data. Summarize it based on geographies, based on industries, and the data is on my website, and you can find it if you go to my data part of my website. In fact, you will find the current year's data set, the January 2018 data set at the first line. And if you want the data from previous years, you will find whatever data I have in the archive data sets. Now, I don't hold back on any of the data. Almost everything I collect, I share. So it's everything you see is what, what you see on my website is basically what I have. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to lay the foundations for what I saw this year when I looked at the data. So let me start with the what. What I do is I, col I collect raw data. And for this, I'm dependent on my raw data providers. I use a variety of these providers and I'm incredibly grateful to them because without them, I could not do what I do. I collect the raw data and it's mostly raw accounting data, revenues, earnings, all the numbers in the financial statements and raw market data, price data, trading volume data. And I get it for every publicly traded company. The only criterion I impose is that the company has to have a market price. So if it has a market price, it's in my data set. Now, some of you might push back and say, why don't you just look at the largest companies, the most heavily followed companies, the companies with the best information? And here's the reason why. Statistically, the minute I start sampling and screening the data, my biases are going to come into play. So if I just look for data from the most liquid companies, I will get that data, but that data might not reflect the market as it is today. So I'm going to screen, not screen at all, and look at every publicly traded company. And that data set was a pretty large one. At the start of 2018, I had 43,848 companies for which I had information. Some I had more information than others, but that's my complete data set. That's up slightly from the 42,678 companies I had last year. Now, if you take a look at the data, here's how I break it down. I break it down into broad groups. And here are my five broad groups. I start with the U.S., not because I'm parochial, but because I have U.S. data going back 26 years. It's the only data set I have for all 26. For the last 10 or 12 years, I have expanded that data to include, global, to include global data, and I break the rest of the world down into Europe. I look at, uh, I look at emerging markets, and that's the biggest data set by far. Now, I look at Australia, New Zealand, Canada, because I'm not sure where to put them, and I look at Japan. So basically, my global data set is broken down to five big groups. Now, if you look at the emerging market data, it is a big data set, so I have a subgrouping. I have India and China as separate markets simply because there are enough companies within each market that I can treat them separately. I have Latin America as one grouping, small Asia, that's all Asian company, companies that are not in India, China, or Japan. I have uh, Eastern Europe and, and Russia as a grouping, and I have Africa and the Middle East. So basically, I have a big, a broad grouping and a subgrouping, and I look at the data on these groupings. Now, what's the data I look for? I pretty much look at all the data that I'm interested in in corporate finance, and that ranges the spectrum. I start with the risk numbers. I'm not fixated on betas, but I do report the betas that I find for sectors, and I report all kinds of betas, unlevered betas, levered betas, I also look at standard deviation stock price. For those of you who can't stand betas, you can use that. I look, report standard deviation operating income. You have to take it with a grain of salt because I do need about 10 years of data to get a reasonable measure of standard deviation. And I also report a measure of risk called a high-low risk measure based on the high and the low prices. So that, in a sense, is a rough proxy for how volatile a stock is. Then I look at profitability measures. I look at every conceivable margin I can compute. Net margins, operating margins, EBITDA margins, EBITDA before R&D margins, essentially by sector. Then I look at returns. Returns in equity, returns in invested capital, and I compute excess returns, where I compare the returns in equity to the cost of equity and the returns in capital to the cost of capital within each sector. Now, those excess returns become a measure of value creation, and it's a number that I will come back and emphasize more in a later post, but it looks at whether companies are creating or destroying value when they grow. For the cost of funding measures, I compute the cost of equity, cost of debt, and cost of capital. I do everything in U.S. dollars simply to keep the numbers comparable across companies, but I give you a very simple way of com converting these numbers into a different currency if that's your objective. I look at measures of financial leverage. I look at debt to equity and debt to capital numbers, both on a book and a market basis. I look at debt as a, as a percentage of EBITDA, just to see how much companies have borrowed relative to their 
operating cash flow. If you define EBITDA as a rough measure of operating cash flow. And I look at interest coverage ratios to see how comfortable they are making interest expenses. For dividend policy, I start with dividend payout and yield, the old-fashioned measures. But I also have two other measures that I've introduced and added on over time. One is dividends as a percentage of free cash flow equity. Free cash flow equity is my measure of potential dividend, cash left over after every conceivable need has been met. And I also compute dividends plus buybacks. Increasingly, as you will see, especially as we go later into the post, that companies are shifting away from traditional dividends to stock buybacks, dividends plus buybacks as a percentage of the cash flows. I look at pricing multiples, or every conceivable you know, equity or enterprise value multiple. I look at PE ratios, PEG ratios, price to book ratios, EB multiples, EB to EBITDA, EB to EBIT. I, EV to invested capital, I look at EV to sales ratios. Now again, just to get a measure of what pricing looks like across sectors. For the cash flow add-ons, I look at working capital numbers, capital expenditure numbers, net capex numbers, ways of computing reinvestment at companies. And finally, for risk premiums, I estimate equity risk premiums by country for 180 countries. And I also estimate default spreads for different ratings classes, all of which is raw data that I would need in valuing companies, and then analyzing them on a corporate finance standpoint. Now let's look at the why. Why do I do this? I would love to tell you that I'm the mother Teresa of data, but I'm not. I don't do this because I'm altruistic, because I love to make the world a better place. I do it because I'm selfish. I'm selfish because I like looking at the data for four reasons. One is it gives me perspective. Perspective in what sense? One of the ironies of the last 20 to 25 years is as we've acquired or received more data on individual companies, as our access to data has improved, tunnel vision has increased. We get more and more focused on our individual companies because we have so much data at the company level, we forget the rest of the world exists. By looking at industry averages, I get perspective. Let me give you an example. A few months ago, I valued Indofoods, an Indonesian food processing company. I'll make a confession. I know very little about food processing business in Indonesia. By looking at the average margins across Southeast Asian food processing companies, I got a sense of what a high margin would look like, what an average margin would look like, what a low margin would look like. So on number after number when I value companies, having access to those industry averages is going to give me perspective. Second, investing is filled with rules of thumb, right? Like what? A stock with a peg ratio is less than one. A stock that trades at less than book value is cheaper. It, basically, these are rules of thumb that investors seem to have devised over. And these rules are often devised in a different time for a different market. I'm not sure these rules of thumb even make sense anymore. And the only way to see if they make sense is to look at the actual data. Is the peg ratio less than one an indication that a company is cheap? The only way to find out is how many companies traded less than a peg ratio of one. Maybe half the companies in the world do so. So rules of thumb can be taken apart by looking at the data. I'm also curious. I'm curious about questions to which I don't know the answers. Do U.S. companies pay their fair share in taxes? I don't know. The only way to find out is to look at the data. If I trust experts who claim to know everything, and who substitute their opinions for facts, I'm going to be going down all kinds of garden paths from now through eternity. So I'm just curious to know the answers to questions that pop up. And finally, there are trend lines in the data. And one of the reasons I don't make jarring changes in the way I compute my numbers is because it allows me to see how these numbers have evolved over time. So now that the tax code in the U.S. is is going to change pretty dramatically this year. It'll be interesting to see how the numbers shift next year. And maybe they will, maybe they won't. The only way to find out is to look at the numbers. Now, having collected the data for my curiosity, for my selfish reasons, I don't see any reason why I should keep it for myself. After all, there's no secret sauce in this data that's going to allow me to make a ton of money. There's nothing I'm doing with the data that somebody else with, this, with the same access to the data could not do. So I see no harm in sharing. And if you find the data useful, by all means, use it. I'll treat it as deposits in my good karma bank that I will draw on in future years, I'm sure. Now, let's talk a little bit about the quirks that I run into every year when I do this data analysis. The first is timing. I do all of my data collection analysis over a five-day period. I started after close of trading on Friday last week. So I started on December 30th, and I went all the way through last night. So it's basically all the data has been collected over five days. 
I could I I would tell you that the data is updated as of these five days, as of the start of this year, but that updating is not the same updating across all my data. The market data is updated by the minute of the day. It's actually as of the end of trading on December 31st. So my interest rates, my market prices are as of that day. My accounting data, on the other hand, reflects my most recent financials. And for most companies, that'll mean that we're looking at trailing 12-month data. So when you see my trailing earnings, my trailing book value, my price earnings ratios, my ratios, they're computing, computed using the trailing 12 months, which for most companies in my data set will be the data ending in September 30th of 2017. I will make no apologies for that because that is the reality you would face as an investor on January 2nd of 2018, is that is the most updated accounting data you will have. Obviously, as the data for the last quarter comes out, the numbers for 2017 will shift. But let's face it, as you invest today, you won't know what those numbers will be. Second, there will be missing data. When you're looking across companies, across the markets that I'm looking at, there are some very small companies and some very illiquid markets in my data set. Some of them don't have all the data I would like them to have. Rather than eliminate them from my sample, I will keep them in and compute the numbers that I can, because I think throwing the numbers out will create biases that will make my analysis worse off. There are accounting inconsistencies. We, we know that accountants don't do things consistently across companies. They take the biggest capex at technology companies and pharmaceutical companies, which is, of course, R&D, and treat it as an operating expense. They take the biggest source of debt at retail and restaurant companies, which is lease commitments, and treat it as an operating expense. Now, they will eventually come to their senses, but we can't wait for accounting routes to come to their senses. So I'm going to correct leases and R&D. I'm going to treat R&D as capex. I'm going to treat leases as debt. So my numbers will reflect those changes already made. And finally, will there be mistakes in the data? Of course. Some of those mistakes are my mistakes because working with a spreadsheet that has 43,848 columns, I'm sorry, rows and 150 columns, you're going to mess up. And I'll admit I probably messed up. I've tried to check for all my mistakes, but I'm sure a few slipped through. Some of the mistakes are not mine. They come from the raw data. And again, I've tried to screen for those mistakes, but some of them will still slip through. The data sets that are probably the most reliable, least affected by mistakes are the US and the global data sets, but I've done the best I can to clean for the data. Finally, the caveats. I have no qualms about you using the data. Please do. You don't even have to give me credit if you do. But here are three things I'd like you to remember. One, remember numbers are not facts. When you see my estimate of return on invested capital, it is my estimate. When you see my estimate of a debt ratio, it's my estimate. What do I mean by that? To get to those numbers, I had to make judgments about what to treat as debt. Now, you might agree with my judgments, you might disagree with them. And I've tried to be as transparent as I can about how I computed the numbers. But the reason my numbers might not be the same as numbers you see on a different website is or a different service is because I've made judgments along the way and I have to. Second, the past is not prologue. Just because I've given you the historical data on stock returns doesn't mean that future stock returns are going to revert back to history. Mean reversion is a powerful force, but it's not inexorable. So you can, tr you can, you can look at history and learn from it, but don't assume that history will always repeat itself. And finally, just because everybody does it, doesn't make it right. So when I report those industry averages for debt ratios and dividend payouts and investment returns, you will notice patterns. You will notice sectors that borrow more money than other sectors, pay more dividends, but they've done it for a long time. And the fact that they've done it for a long time doesn't make it right. After all, sectors do change over time and many sectors don't seem to reflect those changes. So take a look at what companies do, but always ask the question, does it make sense? In fact, that's going to be the core of some of the posts that are going to follow this one where I look at the data. So in closing, I hope you do find this data useful and I hope you find, uh, you find a way to build it into your analysis. If you do find it useful in your analysis, take ownership of it. Don't blame me when things go wrong. After all, all I'm doing is providing you with the industry average data. You can choose to use it. You can choose not to use it. I wish you the very best for this coming new year. And I will be putting up a series of posts on this data that will stretch out over the rest of the month. And I hope to see you then. Thank you very much for listening.